the work of teaching is the core idea of what churches should be doing. Evangelists are teachers who preach the word in season and out of season because it is in the knowing of God, the the learning about God, the very knowing God is the result of the teaching from God in His Word. And that is what will save us. The saving knowledge is Christ and what He has done and the good news that we are to obey, but it is that knowledge that we must put in our mind. And this is what we want in this teaching to do, is to put into your mind. But whether it is sticky notes, ribbons on our fingers, or notifications on our phones, we all need to be reminded The reminders that we need in our daily life is something that even in the New Testament letters, the repetition of that is evident. Studies say that humans forget about 50% of new information within an hour. That means today, 50% of you, on average, if you learn something new today, will forget it completely by tomorrow. So I work every day so that that doesn't happen. Right? I want you to remember everything that I say. It also says that up to 70% of those people who le- learn new information will forget it within, uh, I said within an hour. I hope I said that right. And 70% will lose it within a day. Within a day. So without reinforcement, people tend to forget up to 90% of what they've learned within a month. That's scary to me. Number one, you work so hard to bring all this information to people and then within an hour, half of them forget it. And then 90% of them forget it within a month. Now, I've raised teenagers, so I know it's true. That was a joke. Come on, people. (laughs) But the reality is, is that there are factors that affect how long it takes us to forget things. Might be the nature of the information. It could be the way that we have been engaged as an individual with that information. It could be, in fact, the state of mind that you're in when you're given that information, and certainly how relevant you consider it to be, and what emotions the information creates. All of those are factors that cause us to affect our memory. So when the New Testament talks about it, notice Paul tells Timothy Remain in Ephesus so that you may instruct. Notice he'll also say, command and teach these things. Notice he will say, instruct those who are rich. Notice also he will say, instruct them to do what is good. Then he'll remind them in chapter 2, remind them of these things. And charge them before God not to fight about words. This is useless and leads to the ruin of those who listen. Be diligent to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the word of truth. That is the function that I hope I serve well. It is the function of why we gather in connection with the memory that we put in mind in the memorial of Jesus' sacrifice. But the text for today's lesson comes from this. Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to slander no one, not to be contentious, but to be gentle, showing every consideration For all people. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. And he'll go on to say, But when the kindness of God our Savior, His love for mankind appeared, He saved us. Not on the basis of deeds which we did in righteousness, but in accordance with His mercy 
by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He richly poured out upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This statement is trustworthy. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and beneficial for the people. And so today, that's what I want to talk about. Number one, I can be sure that what I'm teaching you is biblical because it is the biblical text of what Paul, the apostle, told Titus the evangelist to do. And so the first thing is, remind them to be subject. Paul has already mentioned in the letter, chapter 1, about Cretans, the place where Titus was, who had a notorious and turbulent reputation that one ancient writer named Polybius says they were constantly involved in insurrections, murders, and internecine wars. They were a fighting people. They were the Vikings of the Mediterranean. There were people who were known to to be such strong and violent people. And out of those people who had grown up with that kind of culture, Christians came. Saved by the Gospel of Christ. Even though in Crete that wasn't the only place where violence was the norm of life, it wasn't the only place where pride and egotism was the way of of handling every issue. Paul writes to the church at Rome in chapter 12, every person is to be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. Even Peter will say in chapter 2 of 1 Peter, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is God's will for you. Christian citizens, don't give the state unconditional allegiance. But God gives to Christians who are citizens the responsibility to be subject. The state's authority has been delegated to them by God. They did not convene with God. They did not speak with God and say, by the way, God, what do you want us to do? But God has set in motion that pattern of government inspiration tells us. Certainly it is true. We must obey God rather than men. But to the Cretans, Paul tells Titus, as he does Rome, and Peter tells those that he speaks to all over the Mediterranean world, you need to be subject. There is no powerful light that can be emitted than the powerful light of obedience by subjection. That's why he'll say next, remind them to be obedient. In a culture where you are going to tell me what to do. That sounds a little American. He says, be obedient. Christians are to be law-abiding as far as our conscience permits. We are to be public-spirited as well, to be ready and eager to do whatever is good whenever we have that opportunity because as obedient children, Peter says. This is how you're to live. As obedient children. So we have to be reminded to be obedient. Kids, when I was a teenager, I had to constantly be reminded by my parents to obey. It wasn't because I was dumb or slow to learn. It's because adults need to be reminded too. Just like the police officer that pulls you over. For speeding in the zone that you regularly speed in, like Shenandoah. We have to be reminded to be obedient. It is not 
our nature to yield to anyone who is in of a superior authority to tell us everything what to do, and we will do it exactly like they say. The devil is in us in that sense, and we want to self-will everything. And Paul tells Titus, you need to remind these Christians to be obedient. Even Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. John will say, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. So James has a very poetic and powerful way to illustrate this point. Paul tells Titus, you need to remind them to be subject. You need to remind them to be obedient. And James says, now prove yourselves doers of the word and not just hearers who deceive themselves. In other words, you've heard what the preacher has said today. 50% of you in an hour are going to forget. 70% of you in a day are going to forget. And by the end of the month, 90% of you are going to forget. But God reminds us every day that our lives are to be proving that we do what he says every day. Prove yourselves a doer of the word. And then he says, remind them to be ready for every good work. It's interesting that he makes this observation in a context that gets a lot of press for us to understand the enormity of grace and mercy that happens because of our salvation. Notice he'll say in verse 4, when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us. Not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to His mercy. And then he says at the end in verse 8, this saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. Out of grace comes a reality. Out of mercy grows this enormous plant of giving. That grace transforms us within to want to do good. In fact, good works form this Sandwich, in a sense, in the entire reading. And Paul's point to Titus is that the manifestation of of working to manifest what it is God wants us to show in our subjection, to show in our obedience, will be evident to all. Jesus didn't say, you are the light of the world in a vacuum. He didn't say you are the salt of the earth because it was a poetic way to say something hallmarkish. It is what we are. Christ Jesus who gave Himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for Himself a people for His own possession. Forced to do good. Enslaved to the rights to do what is right. No. Purify for himself a people for his own possession. Eager for good deeds. Where does that eagerness come from? It doesn't come by the transformative exhortation of a great preacher. That eagerness comes from grace. That those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and beneficial for people. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Behold, Jesus says, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to reward each one as his work deserves. And glory and honor, Paul writes, I went too far ahead, to everyone who does what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek.
Notice how Titus pictures that obedience and good works. Verse 9. Avoid foolish debates. Avoid genealogies. Avoid quarrels. Avoid disputes about the law. Because all of them are unprofitable and worthless. Even reject a divisive person after warning him one time and two times. But the point is, good works manifest themselves through people who are eager to do them. And then he tells them to stop what they were. Because now that we have been transformed by the gospel, this is the way our life should look. Paul writes to the Corinthians, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor those habitually drunk, nor verbal abusers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. We have to come to realize how empty of hope and purpose is our life without God. It's foolish to count as unimportant this great spiritual counsel that we need to be reminded about all over and over and again, as if somehow... Well, well, Don, that's just the way I am. Don, I'm always going to be that way. Don, I was influenced by, etc., etc. When will we allow ourselves to be influenced by the Creator of the universe? When will we allow ourselves to be influenced by the Savior of mankind who gave everything for us so that we could have everything in eternal life? The transformative way that gospel changes is not miraculous. It's in the reality of understanding who we are without it. And so he tells us to quit slandering people. A great reminder in the election year. He tells us to quit being contentious. To be the fighter. I even had a Christian once tell me that he was more of a fighter than a lover. And God's just going to have to take him that way. Okay. And quit being enslaved to our lust and our pleasures. Living with malice, living with envy, and hatefulness hating one another. The very famous, though directly... Um, though not biblical in its direction. Super Bowl commercial, he gets us. Doesn't get Jesus. But at the same time, when those kind of things happen, we, it's just like this enormous amount of hatefulness emerges and bubbles up out of Christians as if they have forgotten what they're supposed to be reminded of. Stop the hate. Begins with me. And then Peter would write, For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they do not make you useless nor unproductive in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the one who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted. Listen very carefully. Having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choice of you. 
For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. I need to remind you, like Paul told Timothy and Titus, to stop what you were and start being what God has called us to be. And it's interesting, and as I emphasized again, that Paul connects all of this reality to one truth that we need to be reminded about all the time. Remind them of God's kindness. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, that the announcement and the, 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 betray, the, the portrayal of this enormous picture of the suffering servant dying in a way that people would despise him, Isaiah 53. Where he would experience things that no human would ever want to experience, certainly for the benefit of others, Psalm 22. But yet, because he has, as we talked about last week, set his eyes on the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and was rewarded by sitting down at the right hand of God. And ladies and gentlemen and young people and everyone, He did that for you. So be reminded about the kindness of God. As we witness His unselfish devotion to our well-being, not only should we be confident that His gift is more adequate to lift us out of our despair, to lift us out of our uh, uh, hopelessness, and raise us to a plane of existence where we know we are valuable, where we know we serve a purpose, and we need to accomplish that because of the kindness of God. And I want you to notice something else he says. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy. He will later say, by the washing of regeneration, there is never a de-emphasis in Scripture on the human response to the call of the Gospel when those on the day of Pentecost asked in Acts chapter 2, hearing that great plan that God had accomplished in Jesus Christ, knowing that they themselves had been part of His own, their betrayal against the Messiah and causing Him to be crucified, they asked, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized Every one of you. Full stop. But to make the act of baptism have any meaning at all does not come because the water is warm, as our dear sister in Christ this week remembered last week. It isn't because... a. a, clerically robed gentleman or woman in our culture today is the person imparting that grace. That's unbiblical. The reason that it has any meaning is because of the kindness of God. We were regenerated because of His mercy. And that's why we can walk in newness of life and that our old body of sin is done away with not because we have accomplished it, because we never will. Christians being addressed by John in 1 John chapter 1 are reminded that if we say that we have no sin, we are liars, but I have written these things so that you may not sin, but when you do sin. (laughs) Every one of us who are Christians in this room, we've sinned. And we still face it. And we have to be reminded that He saved us not on the basis of deeds we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy. I need to remind you that it is the kindness of God. And renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Notice He uses two words, regeneration and renewing. The idea behind this, I don't have the word regeneration up there, but we are regenerated and we are renewed. 
Regeneration, talking about the moment where He, by His blood, is able to forgive us of our sins because of our faithful obedience. But the ongoing reality of our life when we, after we've obeyed the gospel is that He continues to renew us. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins when we confess them. But the promise of that by the Holy Spirit is God's kindness. How many times have you asked someone for forgiveness? One time, two times, three times, five times, ten times? When do you finally give up that they're not going to forgive you anymore? By God's kindness, we have renewing. That being justified by His grace, Paul makes it clear, justified, the legal term to be made right before God, is something God has accomplished. God has accomplished it by providing the redemptive model, the redemptive plan, the redemptive sacrifice in His Son, so that when we trust in what God has done for us and respond to the words that He has given us in our faith, we're saved by grace. We are not counted just by a righteous God because God sees righteousness in us. We are counted right by God when He sees faith in us. that we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Made heirs. I've never ever wanted to be an executor. But I've had to do that. And the recipients who receive from an estate a financial settlement or whatever it happens to be, could look at it as, I've earned it. Or they could look at it for what it really is. It was a gift. And whatever we, requ- you know, this is not an issue about what requirements they have to meet to, in order to receive the settlement from the estate. The whole point is, is that Paul tells Titus to remind the Christians that the hope that they have is that God made them heirs. There weren't conditions that God said, put in motion and said, the world can't have this blessing unless the world does this. I'm not trying to say that you don't obey the gospel. The Bible says that. But Paul's point to Titus is that we are made heirs. And the act of being made an heir that we have not earned at all, being given a a, a settlement in an estate in the human sense of those things, is because the person who died and wrote those words wanted to give it to you. And God wants you to be His heir. Because He's kind. Because of His mercy, because of His grace, God has allowed us to be His. And we need to be reminded about this all the time. So that we can go out into the world with a confidence, not because I can preach like Paul and I can preach like Peter, but knowing that no matter who I am and what I am, I can tell the love of Jesus. The reality and the truth of this message, reminding them to be subject, reminding them to be obedient, reminding them to stop what they have done, and reminding them that God is kind. Is the answer you need to remember it more than an hour. More than 24 hours. And more than a month. Because that's who we are as the children of God.